Well, one of the one of the great characters of the Bible was Joseph, the son of Jacob. As we read in the Bible, we read that Joseph was a great man. And yet Joseph was hated by his brothers. And Joseph was one that they were very jealous of. And the Bible tells us that they were so jealous of Joseph that they sold him into slavery. And so Joseph went down to Egypt. He'd been sold into slavery. And he went to the house of Potiphar. And all he did there was good and bless his master. And the result of that is that he was slandered and he was cast into prison. But he did well in prison and he served his master there. And yet he languished in prison for many years and he would even help those who were in the prison and interpreted their dreams, but they forgot him. And Joseph was, we might think around 13 years, Joseph seemed to be abandoned, even though he had received dreams early on that he would be the leader of his family. Well, there was a famine that came across the land of Canaan, and because of the famine, the sons of Jacob went into the land of Egypt, and they had no idea that Joseph was there. They had no idea that Joseph had become second only to Pharaoh in all the land of Egypt. And they went down to Joseph to get food, but they didn't take their brother Benjamin because Jacob wouldn't let Benjamin go. And so after the first trip, Joseph, though they didn't know it was Joseph, said that they could not come back again unless Benjamin came with them. And they go back to the land of Canaan and they eat their food for a while, but the famine continues. And so they need to go back and they say to their father, Jacob, we need to go back. But Jacob says, the man won't receive us unless we have Benjamin. And Jacob, in one of the stirring quotes of the Bible, he says, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you would take Benjamin. All these things are against me. And so Jacob thought everything was against him. But we know better. We know that everything was for him. And so they do take Benjamin down, and then in a process of events, then they start to go back. But Joseph had planted a cup into the bags of Benjamin, and in essence, Joseph is going to give them one more test to see if they have changed. And so he gives them the opportunity to abandon Benjamin, and they could all go back and everything would be fine. But they won't do that now. In other words, before when it was so easy to do right, they would sin. And now when it's so easy to sin, they will do right. And Judah says to Joseph, your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, let me bear the blame before my father forever. Now therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me? For fear that I see the evil that would overtake my father. So Judah offers to stay in the place of his brother Benjamin because he will not be willing to let Jacob's hair go down to the grave in sorrow. And then in chapter 45, Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried, have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. And we would say that's one of the most touching passages in the Bible where Joseph revealed himself to his brothers. And yet we would say in our passage today, there's someone greater than Joseph that the passage speaks about. 
So turn with me, if you would, to Zechariah chapter 12 as we continue in our study of the book of Zechariah. And this great prophet, in essentially, essentially we would say three sections, one through six, and then seven and eight, and then nine through the rest of the book. And nine through 14 are these two great burdens. And nine through 11 is this burden against the nations and the nations that God will judge. And then 12 through 14, this burden against the nation Israel, but really not against them, but it says that God will deliver them in the midst of the judgments to come. And this is a sense an apocalypse. This is almost like a revelation in the Old Testament. There are portions of the Old Testament that look far into the future, like the book of Revelation. And I would say the book of Isaiah and the book of Zechariah are probably the two foremost. And this section of Isaiah from chapters 9 through 14 is the most quoted section in the New Testament. And so here we read in chapter 12 and verse 1, the burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. So this is the second part of the burden sections, and this goes through chapter 12 through verse 14. Thus declares the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. So he's saying the God who created all things, the God who has all power, and the God who created man. This is what he's about to say. Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And so he's referring specifically to the city of Jerusalem. He'll talk in a bit about Judah, which is the area around there. And he calls it a cup of reeling. And the idea here probably is that it's a cup. It's a cup that looks desirable. It's a cup that looks attractive. It's a cup that one would want to drink. But when one drinks that cup, then it'd be like someone who drank a, a very powerful uh, alcohol or something that might make them see strange things that might affect them in a very negative way. And so it's a cup that causes reeling. And so what does he say here? He says, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And the peoples there would refer to Gentiles. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. So in the book of Zechariah, Zechariah tells these people after the exile that God is with them, that God is going to rebuild them as a nation and as a city and as a temple. This is going to happen. But now he's looking further into the future. And I think he's looking into the end times. And he's saying that Jerusalem will be sieged or besieged by all the Gentiles. Now, Jerusalem certainly has been besieged many times historically, but I think as you'll see in this passage, he's talking about a final siege against the city. And not only the city, but also against Judah. In verse 3, it will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured. And so in a similar way that the cup would cause reeling, that it's a stone that they would come and they would want to take, but if they try to pick up the stone, it's such a heavy stone that it will injure those who would want to pick it up. And all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. Now this presupposes that they're there. And of course we could say from a present standpoint, the nation Israel, at least in part, is there. It also seems to presuppose that there's something there of great value that the nations want, and I think there is. We would also say that it presupposes the regathering of the nation. I think it presupposes probably the idea we've seen in the previous chapter of an antichrist or a false shepherd who breaks a treaty with them, and now they're subject to the wrath of the nations, and then it presupposes this attack against them, the nation Israel in the land, and I think that is what the prophet here speaks about. So that's the siege of Jerusalem, which I believe is yet future to occur. And then in verse 4, we read, In that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with bewilderness, excuse me, with bewilderment, and his rider with madness. So it seems that now God is going to supernaturally intervene, that somehow or other he's going to 
cause these nations that have gathered against them in a military attack to, to fail, that I will strike every horse with bewilderment and his rider with madness. And again, these are similar to other prophets we might read. The prophet Ezekiel says something similar to this as well. But I will watch over the house of Judah while I strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. And again, sometimes we read this and we say, how can this be? This seems hard for us to imagine. And again, sometimes people say, well, the ancient weapons referred to here that they may be figures of speech for more modern weapons. And that, I guess, is possible. But I interpret a passage literally unless there's some reason not to. And I think it's certainly possible to interpret it literally as well. Believe it or not, when the United States entered into a conflict in Afghanistan in 2001, I think there's a movie out about it right now, many of the people succeeded and they were riding on horseback. And so here, uh, you know, that's what the prophet says, that's what I'm going to believe. Is it possible that there could be weapons that disarm mechanical weapons and so people resort back to ancient type weapons? I think that's certainly possible as well. And so he says he's going to strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. Then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, a strong support for us are the inhabitants of Jerusalem through the Lord of hosts, their God. Now Judah is around Jerusalem and the environs in a, in a, a larger area. And so they look to Jerusalem and say, these people are going to support us. And then it says they're going to support us through the Lord of hosts, their God, which would suppose to me that, that many there seem to be believers in the true God. And then in verse 6, in that day, and the phrase in that day is, a, is an important phrase. In chapters 12 through 14, it's used 19 different times, in that day. And the idea there, I think it's looking forward to this future uh, end time event. And so what does he say? He says, In that day I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot among pieces of wood and a flaming torch among sheaves, so that they will consume on the right hand and on the left all the surrounding peoples, while the inhabitants of Jerusalem again dwell on their own sites in Jerusalem. So in other words, he's going to embolden them. He's going to energize them. He's going to give them, I think, military success. Verse 7, the Lord also will save the tents of Judah first, so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem will not be magnified above Judah. So again, these, these two will work in harmony, and he's not just going to exalt those in Jerusalem, but those in Judah as well. And then it says in verse 8, In that day the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David. And the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. So in other words, he's saying that God will embolden and energize these people, and one who's feeble will be strong like David, and the house of David, which would indicate that the house of David in some way is known, would be like God. And then he says, like the angel of the Lord. And of course, we've seen that in the Old Testament so many times. The angel of the Lord is the one who fights and strives and protects Israel. And then in verse 9, And in that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. So I'd say we see here, the siege of Jerusalem, we see here the deliverance of Jerusalem. And then let's look in verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. So now there's some spiritual work now, does this come after the deliverance of verse 9? Is it cotemporaneous of the deliverance? Uh, it seems to me that it comes after, but still there's a few questions from the chronology here. But he says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. Now, I believe that's a reference to the Holy Spirit. That's a, 
a, a phrase that we might see in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. It's an idea that God pours out his spirit on people in the idea that he enlightens them. He draws them to himself, and something very special is going to happen. He's going to pour that out upon them. And then what does it say? So that they will look on me so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as for an only son and weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Now let's look at that a little closer. They will look on me. Now that's something that's going to happen in the future from the standpoint of the prophet Zechariah, he's saying there's going to be a great future event where the nations are going to be gathered around Jerusalem, where God's going to intervene and he's going to deliver them, and then they're going to look on me. Now, some translations say look to me, some say look unto me, but that's something that's going to happen in the future. They're going to look on him, and then it says, whom they have pierced. That means that he's come before. And when he came before, he was pierced. Now let's stop and ask ourselves a question. Obviously, God is the one who's speaking here. Now, first of all, we might say, how do you look at on to God? How do you look at God if he's a spirit? And you could say, well, maybe some sort of a theophany, maybe some sort of appearance of God. But it says more than that. They will look in the future on me, whom they have in the past pierced. Now how do you pierce God? How do you pierce a spirit? And I don't believe you can. So how can we explain this? And then he says, and they will mourn for him. Now notice the change in the pronouns from me to him, But that's not that uncommon in the prophets. You see that in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. You see that in Isaiah, I believe it's 45, verse 21. And I think what is happening here is that God is speaking. And God is saying, they will look on me whom they have pierced. But I would say it's a reference to God the Father. And yet he is so identified with God the Son because Jesus and the Father are one. And so when you reject the Son, you have rejected the Father. And he says, they will look on me whom they have pierced. How do you pierce God? You can't pierce a God who's a spirit, but you can pierce a God who's become a man. You can pierce a God who's taken upon himself human flesh, and the prophets teach that God takes upon himself human flesh. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, and Prince of Peace. In other words, a son will be called Mighty God. Jeremiah 23 says, The Son of David will be called Yahweh, our righteousness. And so what do we see here? We see that they will look on him. Well, actually, it says they will look on me, whom they have pierced. And so what we're seeing here is this idea that that God has come already. And God has come already in the flesh. And God came already in the flesh. And he was rejected and he was pierced. But then it says, and they will mourn for him. And now I believe the speaker is referring to Messiah alone. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And like the bitter weeping over a firstborn... And then the prophet goes on in verse 11. In that day there will be great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning of Hadad Driman in the plains of Megiddo. And that probably refers to when good King Josiah was killed by Pharaoh Necho and he was the best king they had from David until the end. And he was killed by this Egyptian Pharaoh and the people wept and mourned for his death. The land will mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself and their wives by themselves. And probably that just is referring to two families of David, maybe the great family and the lesser family, and they will 
mourn. And then it says, in the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, in the family of the Shimeites by itself, and their wives by themselves. And again, perhaps two families within Levi, one great and one more common, but they all are mourning. And all the families that remain, every family by itself, and their wives by themselves. Well, what do we see here? I think we see the greatest of all reveals. We see the greatest revelation of all. Think about in Isaiah chapter 53, it begins by saying, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And what do we see here? We see the Messiah is revealed. Remember, Joseph was in Egypt, he was sold by his brothers out of jealousy and abandoned and forsaken for 13 years, and yet God raised him up. And they came down and they didn't know him. But the day came when he revealed himself to them. And yet here I think we see a greater reveal than that. You know, the New Testament quotes Zechariah 12, 10 in one form or another in three different places. In John chapter 19, it says, For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, They shall look on him whom they pierced. In other words, the New Testament says that they will look on him whom they pierced. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds. And that, I think, is a reference to Daniel 7. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Now that's an addition because it says in the book of Zechariah that excuse me, that merely the tribes of Israel will mourn over him. But now it's saying that all the tribes, so evidently though some and many Gentiles gathered against Jerusalem will be destroyed, there will be many more Gentiles who will mourn over him. And what's the sense of the mourning? I think the sense of the mourning is this acknowledgement that we have done wrong. This acknowledgement that we have pierced Messiah. That's the sense of the morning. In Matthew chapter 24, again in an end time event, it says, then the, sun, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And I think the picture is that the return of Christ somehow will be manifested in the sky itself, and people will recognize that and recognize him. And then there will be mourning. But we'll see that, that, that this was within the plan of God. Remember when Joseph said to his brothers, what did he say? Do not be angry with yourselves, for God meant it for good. For God meant it to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And what about the rejection of Christ? What about the death of Christ? What about the piercing of Christ? Well, in the book of Acts, the apostles say, this man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death, but God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. In other words, he's saying, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. This was according to the predetermined plan. This was according to the foreknowledge of God. In Acts chapter 4, it says, for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. It is a mistake to say that Israel alone rejected the Messiah. It is a mistake to say that Israel alone crucified the Messiah. Certainly they did, and this passage in the Old Testament teaches that they did. They will look on me whom they have pierced, 
But the New Testament says Pilate was responsible. The New Testament says Herod was responsible. The New Testament says Gentiles were responsible. We could say since he bore the sin of the world, all people are responsible, and we could say it was the plan of God to achieve the greatest good. It is the plan of God to achieve the redemption of the world. And this will bring about good. In the book of Romans chapter 11, it talks about the rejection of the nation of Israel, of Messiah. And it says, if their rejection be the reconciliation of the world, and the point there is he's saying at the present time they've rejected Messiah and that means the reconciliation of the Gentiles. He says, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? He's saying if good things came out of their rejection of Messiah, how much more good will come about out of their acceptance of Messiah? And he says it will be life from the dead. It will usher in the salvation and the kingdom. That's what's ahead. In Romans chapter 11, verse 26, it says, And thus or so all Israel will be saved. How's that going to happen? He goes on to say, just as it is written, The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. What is he saying? I think he's saying Messiah is going to appear. And Messiah is going to be recognized and people are going to believe in him. And God's going to take away their sins and it'll be life from the dead. Now, not everybody has always believed this interpretation. Some of the rabbis have said, well, how do we explain a passage like Zechariah 12, 10? They will look on me whom they have pierced and they will say, well, there's two messiahs. There's Messiah, son of Joseph, or called Messiah ben Joseph, and then there's Messiah, son of, or ben David. And if we're worthy, he'll come as ben David, or son of David, and if we're not, he'll come as son of Joseph. But that interpretation doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because if you read in the passage here in chapter 12 and verse 10, the one who was pierced is the same one who will be coming back and recognized and exalted. In other words, there's not two messiahs. There's one messiah who's come two times or who will come two times. And the same one that was rejected is the one who will be exalted. Then there's another modern rabbi who's even said that, well, there's a Messiah for the Gentiles and there was a Messiah for the Jews. And this man is a trained PhD in New Testament studies as well and has even said, I believe Jesus was, was raised from the dead. But he's not the Messiah for Israel. He's the Messiah for the Gentiles. Is that possible? And I would say it's not possible. It says in Isaiah chapter 49 verse 6, he says, God says to the Messiah, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. In other words, the one who's the servant of Israel, who raises up Israel, is the same one who's the light of the nations, who saves the Gentiles. And what does it say in Isaiah chapter 53? We looked at that a few weeks ago in verse 12. He says, therefore, I will allot him, Messiah, a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong. Why? Because... He poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many. Notice that the one who is given the reward is the same one who died. There are not two messiahs. There's one messiah. And that messiah came once and he was rejected and he will come again. Do you see this passage in this one verse, verse 10, almost has... You know, preachers tend to exaggerate. <laughs> I hate to say that. But almost the whole Bible in one verse, because it says Messiah will come in the future and it will acknowledge that he was rejected in the past and then they will believe and they will be saved. 
And that's what is ahead. That's what is ahead. And that's the message of the Bible. That Messiah will come back because he has come before. What does the Apostle Paul say in Acts chapter 26? And he says, and so... I stand before you today, testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophet said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he should be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. He says, I'm preaching the Old Testament, which is the New Testament fulfilled. Or the Old Testament predicted, the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old. What did Peter say on the day of Pentecost? Peter was explaining to those people what had happened. And what does he do? He quotes the Psalms. He quotes Psalm 16, verse 10. Thou will not abandon my soul to the grave, neither will thou allow thy Holy One to undergo decay. And he said that didn't apply to David because his grave is with us to today. To today. That referred to the Messiah. And he said, it wasn't David that ascended into heaven. And then he quotes Psalm 110. And he says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Uh, footstool for thy feet. What's he saying there? He's saying that God has raised the Messiah, that the Messiah is going to be raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of the Father. That's what's happened. Then what does the next verse say? He says, therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God hath made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. Isn't that interesting? The first time they pierced him, but then when he's revealed, they're pierced to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? This is a foreshadowing of this future reveal. But even on the day of Pentecost, when Peter proclaimed the gospel and he taught the prophets and he taught the scriptures and they realized they had rejected Messiah, they were pierced to the heart and they said, what shall we do? And he says, repent. You need to repent. You need to repent of this wrong that you have rejected the Messiah. What does he say? Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God hath made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. What shall we do? He says, repent and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's saying you need to recognize who he is. It was a great day when Israel recognized who Joseph was. But it will be a greater day when they recognize who Messiah Jesus is. And if you've never acknowledged who he is, you need to recognize that. And maybe God needs to pierce your heart. And maybe you need to realize, why did he die? to pay for your sins. If you're a believer, you've already trusted in him. Is there a message for us? Well, the Apostle John says, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him just as he is. And then it says, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him, purifies himself just as he is pure. What is the believer's hope? That he's going to appear, that he's going to return. And he says that is the believer's hope. Now, we're not going to go into the timing, but I believe in one way or another, every believer is going to be a witness to that event. And it says there that we shall look on him. And if that's your hope, then what does the apostle say? He says he is pure, and therefore you and I should be pure. 
If you've never trusted in him, you need to repent and acknowledge that he is the Messiah, that he is God who became a man, and that he died in your place and paid for your sins. You need to do that because you cannot pay for your sins. You can do nothing, but he's done everything on the cross. It says, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But with his shedding of blood, there's complete forgiveness. And we'll see that, Lord willing, next week too in Zechariah 13, where it says there's a fountain that's opened up in Jerusalem, a fountain to cleanse sin. And that fountain was on the cross. If you've never trusted in him, trust in him. If you have trusted in him, are you living like it? Are you living like it? Are you pure? Are you walking in the light just as he himself is in the light? Do you, do you watch what you look at? Do you watch what you say? Do you watch where you go? Do you watch what you do? Are you careful? Do you work, walk circumspectly as the King James says? He says we should because he's pure and we should purify ourselves. Let's pray. Lord, we think of the old hymn that says, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that washes white as snow. Lord, if there's anyone here today who's not sure Friend, you have a decision to make. What do you think of this one who's been crucified? Do you say he's a fraud? Or do you say he's the Lord? They will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And friend, pray with me. Dear God, I believe he is... Messiah. I believe he's the second person of the Holy Trinity. I believe he's God in the flesh who died in my place, who suffered on the cross. I trust in him as my Savior. There's nothing I can do. I trust in what he did on the cross. I trust in him. And as believers, friend, we shall see him as he is. Let us pray, God, help us to be pure. For that is our hope, to see the Holy One. Lord, encourage your people on this pilgrim pathway. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.